Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Katie with the Career Enhancement Core for the Center for the Assessment of Tobacco Regulations uh, at the University of Michigan and Georgetown University and Yale University. Thank you all again for joining us today. We have a great event for you, which will feature two early stage investigators from our pilot funds program. As we wait a, a minute or so for participants to continue to join, I'd like to orient you to the Zoom settings for today's event. Attendees are all joining in listen only mode, so you'll only be able to watch and hear the event. This webinar will conclude with time for questions through a Q&A session at the very end. So please submit your questions for the speakers to the Q&A panel, and you should see that at the bottom of your screen. Since this webinar will feature two speakers, when you submit a question, please indicate the name of the speaker who your question should be directed to. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded and we will archive it on our center website following the event. I think we're just about ready to get started. So I will hand it over to Dr. Ritesh Mistry, and he is the lead of our Career Enhancement Corps. Oh, greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar series. It's the webinar series for the Castor Career Enhancement Corps. We're part of the, the T Cores 2.0 consortium. Uh, we're very pleased to have you all here join us, especially pleased to feature two recipients of our pilot funds program. We have an annual pilot funds program uh, where we put out an RFA sometime in the fall and we get um, a, quite a few applicants uh, doing research that um, involves computational modeling or research that informs modeling. Um, and we fund a small number of those applicants every year. Um, and these two applicants are, are the two that we've selected to feature from our first uh, pilot funds program, uh, Michael Stokolos and Michael Hayashi. Sorry, Mikal Stokolosa and Michael Hayashi are the two speakers that we'll be um, featuring today. Uh, Mikhail, Dr. Mikal Stokolosa will be talking about the effects of uh, the introduction of ICOS on cigarette sales in Japan and the role of price. Uh, and then Michael Hayashi, Dr. Michael Hayashi, will be talking about game theoretic modeling of tobacco industry responses uh, for a proposed ban on menthol flavored cigarettes. Um, so what I'll do is I'll hand it over to Dr. Stokolosa first. He will do his presentation for about 20 minutes. And then I'll introduce uh, uh, Dr. Hayashi in, a, in more detail and he'll do his presentation then. Uh, as Katie mentioned, please, uh, you know, we'll do the Q&A session at the end of the, the webinar, but please do type in your, your questions in the Q&A feature that's on Zoom at any time. Um, so let me introduce Dr. Mikhail Stokolosa a little bit. He's a visiting senior scholar or senior scientist at the Institute of Health Research and Policy at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, before joining UIC, he was a principal scientist in the Economics and Health Policy Research Program at the American Cancer Society. Uh, his research mostly focuses on issues around tobacco taxation and illicit trade. And in this study, he took, uh, he, he's looking at the introduction of a uh, you know, hit not burn product in the Japan marketplace and the role of price. And particularly, uh, I think the interest here is to thinking about how cigarette sales would be affected in that context. So I'm gonna give over to Dr. Stokolosa uh, for his presentation. Um, Dr. Stokolosa, start whenever you're ready. Thank you, Dr. Mistry. Uh, in my presentation today, um, I'll first uh, present our previous study on ICOS in Japan and then uh, go to the study that was funded by Castor. Mm, but first, let me give you a short introduction on, on the heated tobacco products and what that product are. So these products release the nicotine directly from a tobacco leaf. Uh, they heat a processed tobacco leaf substance and high temperature, slightly short of combustion. And we have two um, different 
technologies uh, there. First, um, ICOS, GLOW, and uh, Puzzle, Pulse, I'm sorry, those three brands um, uh, use the technology in which the, um, the tobacco is being heated directly to produce a vapor. And then we have Plume Tech by Japan Tobacco, uh, which is a hybrid product that uh, generates tobacco vapor uh, by heating nicotine-free liquid and passing it through a tobacco-containing capsule. Ca capsule. Um, and earlier this year, as we probably all know, ICOS received an exposure modification orders from FDA, which permits the marketing of those products as uh, containing a reduced level of a, uh, reduced level of or presenting a reduced exposure to harmful substances. Mm, and uh, for tobacco companies, uh, the technology is instrumental in their strategy to move consumers to the new generation products. And in fact, Philip Morris International, the largest tobacco company uh, outside of China, practically entirely relies on, uh, on that technology in their vision of what they call unsmoking uh, the world. Uh, those measures, in, uh, uh, those, I'm sorry, those messages imply that the product is supposed to displace regular cigarettes, uh, but there has been so far little evidence uh, to that matter. So in our earlier study, uh, we decided to test uh, those company cli claims by looking at the relationship between ICOS introduction and cigarette sales in Japan. Japan is one of the two markets where ICOS was first introduced. Uh, and what is important, the test marketing strategy used by Philip Morris in Japan involved an initial uh, expansion into 12 out of 37 prefectures in J Japan, followed by a full national expansion seven months later. This created the condition for a natural experiment where cigarette sales trends in early introduction prefectures could be compared to those in the late uh, introduction prefectures. And so the notion is that if the link between ICOS and regular cigarette sales exists, uh, the trends of ICOS market uh, introduction, I'm sorry, the event of uh, ICOS uh, market introduction will be reflected in the trends of uh, cigarette use. And so we use the, we, we use the CHO test uh, to look at the uh, whether there was a structural break in the trend. The null hypothesis, hypothesis in this test is that the trend in per capita sales remain, remains stable over time. And uh, the alternative hypothesis is that uh, there was a structural break in trends with the ICOS heated tobacco product introduction, that is that the trend lines were kinked in the months uh, when ICOS was introduced in those prefectures. And um, going quickly to the results, we found that uh, the CHO test rejects the null hypothesis of the stability of the trend in favor of the hypothesis that the trend lines per capita, in per capita uh, cigarette sales were kinked at the time of ICOS introduction in each of uh, the 11 um, regions that we looked at. What is important is that even if the CHO test finds that the trends in cigarette sales in Japan were not stable over time, this change in trends could have been caused by factors other than ICOS uh, heated tobacco product introduction. 
And to test for that possibility, we estimated a set of placebo models explaining cigarette sales by a linear trend, each model with a kink for a different month of our analysis. And um, we then compared the R square of that those placebo models to uh, the R square of the model in which the sales trends lines are kinked in the actual month of ICOS introduction. And uh, this graph uh, that you see here um, shows uh, this distribution of R square values associated with all possible rearrangements of ICOS introduction day dates among the regions and the black dashed vertical uh, lay, uh, line um, indicates the R squared of the original model with the true introduction dates. And uh, with, with that distribution and the placement of the actual model in that distribution, we can quite firmly conclude that it's very unlikely that uh, other events outside of the ICOS introduction actually influenced the change in the trends in cigarette sales in Japan. This, um, uh, this research uh, was already published um, and because we showed that the, that the product displaced cigarette sales, um, the manufacturer of the product, Philip Morris International, uh, started going around the world and saying uh, that their product, uh, that we are showing that their product is beneficial for, uh, for public health. So we had to um, publish um, a, a quick letter to the British Medical Journal, that's the other, presentation in which we, we basically say, hey, hold your horses. We just looked at trends in sales and actually survey, surveys of users in Japan uh, found extremely high levels of dual use of cigarettes uh, and HTPs, uh, which we didn't uh, look at in, um, in our study. And, uh, so even if ICOS ever is proven to be less harmful than, than cigarettes, we would, uh, the fact that there is a lot of dual users would greatly undermine any possible effects, uh, um, benefit effects for public health. So moving on to our Castor study. Um, uh, Throughout the time of our previous analysis, the prices of uh, HTPs were relatively stable in Japan. So because of that, we couldn't evaluate the role the product prices played in um, the replacement of um, cigarettes to ICOS. But in October 2018, Japan changed their tax law they introduced a new HTP tax uh, category and uh, increased the excise tax rates on cigarettes, which created a nice setting to examine the impact of prices on HTP sales. Um, just like in the previous study, we used the data obtained from uh, Intech, which is a market research company based in Japan. The company collects data on sales of tobacco products from participating supermarkets and convenience stores and uh, provides tobacco market size estimates for 11 of uh, Japan's 12 geographical regions. And the Castor grant allowed us to purchase the data to cover the time period around and after the, the, the tax increase. Uh, the data cover the period from September, uh, so the entire data cover the period from September 2014 to April 2019. 
Um, and the data covers the sales of heated, heated tobacco units only and does not include the devices uh, itself. And unlike in the previous study, we here obtained uh, the data on all um, devices, uh, all brands of heated tobacco products in Japan and not only on ICOS. On this graph, we can see the trends in cigarettes and HTP sales. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, users stockpiled the product just before the tax increase, and that um, that's that's the, the little spike on on the graph before the the tax increase, and and then after the tax hike. Uh, the um, sales of both uh, HTPs and cigarettes dropped. And uh, before I go to our models, let me sh show you uh, quickly how the tobacco companies uh, uh, present at the Japanese market reacted to the tax change. This table shows the price of the most popular, most popular cigarette brand and the HTP products before and after the tax increase by each of three uh, manufacturers present of, uh, on Japanese market. Um, in the first column, you can see the cigarette price and the second and third column show the HTP price. The price increased across all brands after the tax increase. Um, and to protect the consumers from the full impacts of the tax increase, PMI introduced a new, less expensive uh, HTP brand um, called Heats. And uh, Japan has a very complicated tax uh, structure and I have no time to go into the details of that tax structure. But uh, what you should know is that uh, most of the tax is based on the product weight. Um, and the weight-based tax favors the hybrid uh, HTP technology used in the Japan tobacco plume tech products. The plume tech tobacco uh, uh, containing capsules weigh only about three grams per pack uh, compared to ICOS, which he, um, the pack of heat six um, weigh uh, more than 16 uh, gram per pack. And those packs are supposed to be equivalent for, for the users. So a weight-based tax uh, favored um, um, the, the hybrid technology and therefore the price uh, of the Japan tobacco product, um, uh, it gave the advantage to, to the Japan tobacco um, product. Going to the, um, to the methods of our study and the results, we use a fixed effects models to control for stable characteristics of Japan's regions, such as uh, social acceptability of tobacco use or the general level of tobacco control regulations in the regions. The analysis include a model for HTP and cigarette sales combined. Uh, that's model one, as well as separate models for cigarette sales and HTP sales. Uh, and the primary outcome variable um, are the on and cross price effects for HTPs and cigarette sales, um, which capture the pro product's sensitivity to prices. Uh, and we control for likely coverage, including uh, income, time trend, and seasonality of sales. And, and of this stockpiling as well. Uh, there is um, also a fourth model 
uh, in our analysis, um, which uh, estimates the equation two and three using the seemingly seemingly unrelated regression SOAR method. Uh, and uh, that method permits for the correlation between the uh, error terms of, of, of the models for HTPs and uh, cigarettes. So as you can see at this table, the own price effects are negative and significant, significant or borderline significant in all models, apart from the own price effects for HTPs in model four. Um, this, this is an expected finding that for both cigarettes and HTPs, the increase in price uh, is associated with declining product sales and the own price effect seems to be stronger a little bit for HTPs than for cigarettes. The cross price effects are positive and significant or borderline significant in all models again, um, with an exception uh, of the cross price effects for the uh, HTPs and model uh, in model four. And the, that means that when the price of one product go up, goes up, the, uh, the sales of the other product will also go up. Um, there are several uh, potential red flags in those models. I'll try to quickly go through them. The first is the potential of the endogeneity of the price. When companies set the product prices based on the demand for their products uh, on the market. But in this case, the, the, pr uh, the prices were, the average prices were affected first by introduction of different brands across the time. And then there was a tax increase. So, so there was some exogenous change in prices that we could use. Mm. And the, the second potential, uh, uh, problem is the multicollinearity problem with, in which the um, um, time or trend or seasonality variables uh, and the price variables are, are related. And to account for that possibility, we run a robustness check uh, and um, we estimated the four models without the year and quarter variables. Um, and and we didn't see uh, huge differences with the, with the estimated um, coefficient values. And finally, because we are using a macro panel data with relatively small number of groups and la long time trend, there is still a, a risk of a spurious regression uh, if the variables are, are non-stationary. So um, the models will detect relationships uh, even if there is no true relationship between uh, the variables, if there is this spurious regression. And to check for that, that data stationary, we applied a, a panel uh, unit root test. The test indicates that there at least uh, the dependent variables in the models are, are stationary, stationary. And uh, in additional robustness check, we added a lagged dependent variable um, to, uh, to each model. And the notion is that if the regression is spurious, adding the lagged dependent variable would change the model uh, estimates dramatically, which, which it didn't. Mm -hmm. um, I'm starting to run uh, out of my time, so quickly go through the limitations. First, um, Japan is a little bit funny because they do not have uh, a big e-cigarette market, so there's only HTPs and, uh, and heated tobacco products, so what we find in Japan might not be directly translate, tra uh, 
translatable to uh, to all countries and um, we don't know uh, anything about the devices and the device actually costs um, Mm, the, the cost of the device is substantial, so um, it might prevent uh, switching um, between uh, the products. So the future research should take the, uh, the price of the device itself um, as well into the account. Um, um, and again, uh, this is sales data. We don't know anything about whether those smokers switch completely or do they uh, continue to be dual users of cigarettes uh, and HTPs, in which case we know that even a small number of cigarettes smoked a day is very, very harmful. So if, if there are users who don't wish to quit um then then it, it is still a very dangerous situation there are clear uh, conclusions that um cigarettes are um i'm sorry that htps are responsive to prices um and uh, possibly uh, this um substitution effect where the price increase in one product would result in uh, increase in sales in the other product and this needs to be taken into account by policymakers who introduced um, tax policies on those devices especially on the markets where htps are already present and account for a larger portion of uh, the market. Uh, I would like to thank my co-authors and um, I, I wanted to give floor back to Dr. Misri. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Stopla. So that was a very interesting talk. Uh, we'll move on to the second speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Hayashi. Uh, Dr. Michael Hayashi is a research scientist in the Department of Epidemiology at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. His research focuses on using mathematical modeling and computational modeling in the area of tobacco control and infectious disease control. Um, he also maintains a high-performance computing lab for our center, the uh, CASTOR. Uh, he'll be talking today about the role of uh, not the role of, but the use of game theoretic modeling in understanding tobacco industry behavior. A lot of our research in the past focuses on, you know, individual human behavior around tobacco, tobacco use. Uh, uh, this research, I think, is really interesting because we're thinking about what does the tobacco industry do in the face of changing policies. And Michael is going to talk a little bit about uh, the ban on menthol and industry behavior in response to that. With that, uh, Dr. Hayashi, uh, you can start when you're ready. Thanks, Ritesh. And thanks, Mikhail, for the first presentation. That was really interesting. Um, and hopefully, I would like to talk a little bit today about, um, like Ritesh said, the use of game theory in modeling tobacco regulatory processes, particularly focusing on using game theory to address the behavior of the tobacco industry. So the primary objective of this project, which um, which I've been conducting with Dr. Alex Lieber now at Georgetown, um, congratulations, Alex, by the way. Um, uh, so the objective of our project has been to focus on kind of the following question. How is it that we can incorporate the role of the tobacco industry in tobacco policy modeling and other analyses? The reason that this is an interesting question to us is that we know that the industry is a major stakeholder in tobacco regulatory policy, but they're not often explicitly included in policy models as an actor. And we felt that there was a need to develop theory to explain the policy positions that tobacco companies take. So in order to do this, we wanted to focus on incentives. So what is it that stakeholders in the policy process want? Um, do they care about public health outcomes? If you're a, 
Um, if you're a public health professional, then that likely contributes significantly how much um, how much excess harm can you reduce, how much can you reduce um, exposure, things like that. Uh, if you're an industry actor, you probably care about profit. If you're one of the myriad political actors like um, members of Congress, regulators, um, state uh, state regulators, things like that, you might have other political concerns like satisfying constituencies and things like that. So the one mathematical tool that does a nice job of kind of wrapping these things together is game theory. So, um, so game theory was developed in the 40s or so. Um, largely to to explain human behaviors surrounding things like um cold war concerns like were the russians going to fire missiles at us or and, and are we going to fire missiles at the russians and the overall idea of the method um was to give a mathematical representation of strategic interactions between two or more entities the way that we talk about those in kind of the game theoretic uh, terminology is a, we define a set of players. These are the key actors uh, in our system. So that could be um, a particular tobacco company and a particular regulator. It could be multiple tobacco companies, multiple regulators, more or less any, um, any type or set of actors that you might think are interesting for your particular problem. We also have to define a set of actions, which are essentially what players can do. So these could be continuous uh, continuous variable things uh, stuff like marginal tax rates they could be discrete choices like ban no ban uh, policy a policy b policy c and so on in order to integrate incentives into a game theoretic model we also have to define and construct payoff functions which map the actions of players to numerical values that take into account the costs and benefits of the actions of all players so if if the regulator imposes a certain policy, how does that policy, uh, well, the regulator imposes a policy and the tobacco company responds in a particular way, how does that particular combination of actions influence what each player gets out of the game? So we might think of the revenue lost due to a menthol ban, revenue gained under certain policy scenarios, things like that. And then a critical concept in a game theoretic model, and really what kind of makes this useful from an analytical perspective, is called the Nash equilibrium. So this is sort of the solution concept for a game theoretic model. At a Nash equilibrium, this is a state where every player is receiving their maximum payoff given what every other player is doing. So another way of putting this is that if you're playing along with the Nash equilibrium profile, if you're playing your Nash equilibrium action, then you couldn't do better if you changed your mind, because everybody else who you're playing against is playing their Nash equilibrium action. And that sort of enforces that uh, the players play along with the Nash equilibrium. And this can be useful from a predictive sense to give you an idea of, well, how do we think actors in this game should behave? Or if we want to compare the Nash equilibrium in a theoretical model to what happens in the real world, we might ask, why do people in the real world not play along with the Nash equilibrium that we see in our model? What, what sort of aspects might we need to include in the model or what sorts of conditions might be creating that divergence? Or if we think the Nash equilibrium is desirable, what might we be able to do to try to incentivize people to kind of get back to that path? Game theory has been used in public health research in a few areas, uh, for example, addressing vaccine hesitancy, the balance of risk and protective effects from vaccines, and in particular, the perceived risk and protective effects um, can, can impact the effective coverage of a vaccine. Things like social distancing, so how people um, reduce their contact behavior when they're in the middle of an outbreak, which, um, which I think is particularly keen right now that we're in the middle of a a massive pandemic. And at a, at a lower level, game theory has been used to address things like uh, the evolution of antibiotic resistance among um, bacterial populations. So there are fitness and survival trade-offs when bacteria evolve and when they pick up new traits that can influence how they, what trajectory they take in terms of how, what fraction of bacteria in a given population are going to be resistant to one thing or another. 
on the other hand, um, game theory hasn't been used to my knowledge much to address tobacco regulatory questions. And I think this gap leaves room for some really interesting research, particularly in context of the sort of menthol cigarette regulation landscape. So um, menthol as a characteristic flavor was exempted from the uh, Tobacco Control Act. And from about 2016 to now, the landscape of tobacco products has changed considerably. In particular, there's been the rise of uh, non-combustible non nicotine products, e-cigarettes, the um, the heat not burn products that, uh, that Dr. Stoklosa described previously. Um, and major tobacco companies have had varying success in penetrating the e-cigarette market and penetrating new product categories generally. And what this has led to is a situation where the major tobacco companies have differential market share between menthol cigarettes and e-cigarettes. So the same company doesn't dominate both categories. Of course, I think this is an interesting problem from, from multiple perspectives because um, menthol cigarettes have a fairly major disparities component um, in that they are used very heavily by African American populations and and you can you can kind of see hot spots of menthol cigarette use by um, by by demographic breakdowns throughout the US. Um, and so trying to reduce the usage of menthol cigarettes, I think, has the potential for fairly significant positive health impacts. But of course, um, I think we would tend to expect that the tobacco industry is likely to put up a fight if you're going to ban a major product category that rakes in billions of dollars in revenue every year. So one question that I think is, is interesting to pose is how does this new market landscape, and in some sense, how does the, the change in market landscape over the last five or so years impact the regulatory outlook for menthol cigarettes? Is it still the case that we're uh, that we're likely to see pretty significant monolithic opposition from the tobacco companies to menthol regulation, or are there opportunities to get uh, get pieces of regulation through? So a critical piece of this project is getting a sense for how the industry behaves and why it behaves the way that it does with regard to different policies. Uh, I think, as I mentioned, it's, it's tempting to think of the industry as a monolithically oppositional actor. Um, but one of the one of the things that complicates this picture is the fact that the tobacco companies have occasionally supported major pieces of tobacco regulation, and I think that is a, a kind of strange behavior if we operate under the assumption that most pieces of tobacco regulation are likely to, at least in the short term, reduce revenues from some product category and others. So, so for example, Philip Morris came out in support of the uh, Tobacco Control Act. And Altria and Juul came out in support of the most, the more recent um, age limit increase on tobacco products. And I think some of the statements that the tobacco companies made at the time have been illuminating in terms of giving a sense for their strategic logic. So, in response to the Tobacco Control Act, Philip Morris said um, that the the act will create a framework for the pursuit of tobacco products that are less harmful than conventional cigarettes. So this to me reads as Philip Morris looking ahead at new product categories like heat not burn things um, and, and e-cigarettes where the, the Tobacco Control Act provides an opportunity for alternative products. And of course, if we think about uh, tobacco companies as profit seeking uh, profit-seeking agents, then they don't care where their money comes from as long as they're making more money each year. Similarly, um, Altria and Jules, Altria and Jules made statements to the effect that um, that the the increase in age would address the the surge in teen vaping and and kind of tacitly address the the Ivali problem. Which which caused kind of a, a well a significant PR issue for for Jewel to a certain extent I think this one reads as Ultra and Jewel trying to cement a dominant position over kind of the the large dis dispersed ecosystem of small vape shops and things like that that were selling products that I think were particularly linked to um, to Evoli cases and notably um, this AP article on 
Alter Angel's support of the Tobacco 21 bill notes that um, the company's support of this particular policy drew attention away from other potential proposals that might have been stricter. So we might also think that tobacco companies look at kind of the universe of possible regulatory policies that could come out and and try to decide which ones might give them kind of a PR boost without significantly damaging their bottom line, or that might even give them competitive advantages under some circumstances. So we're, for, our, for this uh, particular presentation, going to focus on the feature of differential market dominance uh, between tobacco companies and, and menthol cigarettes and e-cigarettes. So we're going to really focus on kind of the profit motive as um, as sort of the driving force in why we might think tobacco companies are going to behave one way or another with regard to a potential uh, ban on menthol products. So uh, the way that we've parameterized this is to suppose that we have two firms, one that has the dominant position over menthol cigarettes and the other which has the dominant position over e-cigarettes. These numbers are drawn roughly from the market shares of um, Reynolds and Altria with regard to menthol and e-cigarette products. They're rounded off a little bit for uh, for tidiness. And a question that we pose and that, that informs our model framework is how much of the pre-ban menthol market could each firm convert to e-cigarette products post-ban? So this, this is based off of the notion that if, if there are kind of comparable products on the market, um, a tobacco company might look at a potential regulation and say, well, if we have a good position in some other product category that could stand to gain from a, from damage to another product category, maybe there's a rationale to come out ahead after the piece of regulation, uh, particularly if that company isn't dominant in the product category that, that stands to be damaged most by, uh, by any given regulation, in this case, by a menthol ban. And so some of this, uh, some of this requires a, a notion of how we think consumers are likely to behave in the face of a menthol ban. So there have been a few discrete choice experiments um, conducted trying to get a sense for how consumers view product equivalencies, how they view um, potential switching between product categories, which has suggested to varying degrees that menthol smokers, uh, tobacco smokers generally prefer e-cigarette flavors that match the flavor of their current tobacco products. So regular cigarette smokers prefer tobacco flavored products. Menthol cigarette smokers prefer menthol flavored e-cigarettes. And that e-cigarette or that current smokers have a reasonable willingness to to switch to an equivalently flavored e-cigarette product, or, or this is sort of the the takeaway that I might gather from these discrete choice experiments, which suggests that this mechanism of kind of eating market share from one category to another could be plausible in the face of a fairly, uh, a fairly strict policy like a ban on menthol. So we make what at the end of the day is a very simple game theoretic model to represent this kind of strategic interaction between tobacco firms. And here we're really focusing on what the firms are doing as opposed to sort of explicitly modeling, say, the, regula the regulator behavior or consumer behavior, which we've wrapped up in a more kind of parametric way in how the outcomes actually shake out. So we suppose that each firm can either support, oppose, ignore, or delay a ban. Um, and the payoffs in this game are basically the net change in sales post game. So if you lost X percent of market share from, um, from menthol cigarettes and you gained X or Y percent of, of market share back in e-cigarettes, then that kind of net is your payoff. Um, there's a little bit more to that, but I think this is sort of the cleanest way to describe what's going on under the hood here. We do make a number of assumptions in this model because, as I say, it's it's a very simplified model of the of kind of the strategic interaction. So we suppose that the success of a menthol ban is just probabilistic. Um, essentially, if tobacco companies support a ban, it's very likely to go through. If they oppose it, it's pretty much impossible for a ban to go through. And then there's kind of an intermediate range of outcomes um, through the combinations. We assume also that 
that outright opposition to a ban is more costly than delaying tactics or other things, opposition being mounting a big public and legal campaign to, to scrap the thing, doing heavy lobbying, things like that, where delaying in, in our terms is basically doing things like filing for extensions on the comment period and in, in, in the notice and comment process, things like that. There are tons and tons of really cheap ways to slow things down because of the way that American um, regulatory processes work. We also assume for the purpose of this model that 60% of current menthol smokers will switch to e-cigarettes post ban and that the remaining 40% quit. This is just kind of a, a baseline assumption that um, that we modify a little bit to test kind of a range of different scenarios. And we'll look at one, one interesting case of that a little bit later. So we look at for for the purposes of this presentation, three scenarios. In the first one, we're going to assume that firm B, so that's the one that's strong in e-cigs but not strong in menthol, um, gains 25% of firm A's pre ban menthol market share. So this is supposing that Altria, for example, doesn't do a very good job of converting uh, Reynolds menthol smokers over to e-cigarettes post ban, that their products just aren't positioned very well to do that. In the second scenario, we're going to assume the opposite, that they are quite successful and gain 70% of Fermé's pre ban menthol market share as conversions to e-cigarette smokers or e-cigarette users. So in the first scenario, we can see that the, the Nash equilibrium solution is that both firms either oppose or delay the, uh, the menthol ban because essentially no one stands to gain enough post ban to make up for the loss in sales from, from the ban. So I think that is kind of an intuitive solution here that um, that if a company stands to just strictly lose revenue from a policy and they don't see another way out from that, then that is likely to incentivize opposition. Um, and and part of this is that the coordinated opposition significantly reduces the chance of an actual ban coming through. So that is the closest to the status quo that the companies can come. And the expenditure of resources in opposition doesn't come anywhere close to wiping out the, um, the dollar valued gains of continuing to be able to sell menthol products uh, as, as under the status quo. In the second scenario, and this is the one where firm two, Altria really, is good at converting menthol smokers over to e-cigarettes, we can see that firm A, uh, Reynolds, still is incentivized to oppose a ban under pretty much every circumstance, while Altria is actually incentivized to support it. And we argue that this, in, this result in the model is, well, it's basically because that conversion enables firm B to have a net gain post ban. So the fact that they were weak in, in menthol cigarettes at the start of this thing suggests that they didn't stand to lose an enormous amount. And if they believe themselves to be able to convert a large number of, um, of menthol smokers from their competitors platform, then again, money is money. And uh, that would lead me to believe that, that they would be incentivized That would lead me to believe that they're incentivized to support a ban. So the last quick scenario that I wanted to take a look at is the issue of what consumers do. So how willing do we think consumers are going to be to switch products? How many are, are just going to quit if, if their desired product category goes away? And the way that I'm addressing this here is to sort of change the probability that we assign to consumers switching and look at at what point the Nash equilibrium changes. So this acts as kind of a tipping point on this system. And we can see that, so my initial assumption was that 60% switched, 40% quit. If we decrease the switch probability by just a little bit down to 57%, you get a change in Nash equilibrium such that firm A opposes a ban and firm B delays it because they don't stand to pick up enough, um, enough consumers post ban to make this whole thing worthwhile. Um, and that I think speaks to the fact that we 
I, I think I think one of the interesting results out of this is that we have to be thinking about what is sort of the realistic scenario with regard to consumer behavior and 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 to a certain extent, what might industry actors be forecasting if they're looking at a potential ban? So I'm coming up on time here. A few key takeaways that I think are interesting based on this modeling exercise is that it, it suggests maybe obviously that industry opposition to regulation is not just a given. Unified opposition is most likely when industry players just stand to lose strictly from a regulation. And features like differential market dominance might motivate support for, for actors that do not hold the, the dominant position in a particular product category. It, it also suggests that like I like I mentioned, projections about consumer behavior are likely to influence tobacco company strategic positioning. Um, this is also not to say that the regulator has no role in this whole process, even though we modeled them in a pretty phenomenological way. The scenarios that the tobacco companies find themselves in can be influenced by rulemaking or by legislation. So how successful a a tobacco company is at converting people over to another product likely depends on how permissive the regulatory scheme is to that other product category. And of course, from a public health perspective, that means that um, if we think that a category is equivalently harmful, then we well we probably aren't likely to care so much if if industry actors have that escape valve. We don't want either category. Where if we do think that. A, a new product category is is significantly less harmful. We might suspect that there could be a rationale to to be more permissive to that product category over one which is significantly more harmful. So moving forward, I think uh, there are there are so many ways that this model could be expanded, improved, that that assumptions could be loosened up to be more realistic, um, addressing additional players in the system, other tobacco companies, new entrants public health actors, other political entities like Congress, things like the lobbyists. Um, there are obviously vastly more product categories than we treated, as well as a wider range of policy interventions, things like um, things like the, the taxation policies that Dr. Stoklosa described and, and their impact on the sales landscape, um, product standards, marketing restrictions, all sorts of, of things. So just quickly, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, the pilot grant program. This has been instrumental in allowing us to pursue what I think has been a really fascinating line of research. And of course, uh, David Levy at Georgetown for uh, an enormous amount of helpful feedback and, and, and encouragement in this project. So thank you. And I can turn things back over to questions for both of us. Oh, thank you very much, Michael. Excellent talk. Uh, both of you guys, I think you did a wonderful job. Uh, we have a few questions from the from the audience, which I'd like to ask both of you. Uh, the first one is for Dr. Hayashi. How does the emergence of ICUS, which has menthol flavors, change the conclusions of your analysis? And I guess I want to add a little bit to that question because uh, there's also the issue of cigars. Uh, there's lots of flavored cigars available, particularly filtered cigars. And how would introduction of cigars into your analysis also change or modify your results or your model? That's a good question. I think the way that I would tend to think about other product categories like ICOS or like flavored cigars that might again act as potential release valves for current menthol smokers would be in sort of a similar framework where my suspicion would be if the regulatory scheme is permissive to those product categories, and if the tobacco company believes that there is strong evidence that consumers would actually switch to those products or that they could induce consumers to switch through aggressive marketing or what have you, then those product categories I think would also encourage support of menthol bans for, I mean, particularly for companies that are dominant in those product categories, but not traditional menthol. Or if there is a rationale on the, the tobacco company side that their, their kind of net profit from an alternate product category might even be higher than that on cigarettes and kind of equivalent sales. So I think that's how I would tend to think about that, uh, that issue. Great, great. Thank you, Michael. Um, the second question is for Mikhail. Uh, do we have any evidence if ICOS in the US is causing a similar impact 
on cigarette sales as you found in Japan? And what about other countries? And if you don't have that evidence, are you seeking to do research in that area? <laughs> mm, I, I didn't uh, have a chance to look at um, the data in the US and given my new rule at the University of Illinois at Chicago, it's highly unlikely that I will, but uh, I'm, I'm willing to, uh, to provide my comments to any of, of uh, your students who want to uh, look at it. And uh, I'm, I will be actually more than happy. What my suspicion is that uh, working in the area of uh, taxation around the world, I, we usually see similar um, responses uh, across the markets. So, uh, in high income countries, uh, the, the elasticities for, uh, um, for the demand of cigarette sales that no, do not vary between country that much. What uh, I think is important from, from the studies that we are showing is that don't forget about cigarettes. I know everybody is talking about those novel products, but if you uh, introduce uh, new tax categories for, for those products and you increase the taxes on those products, you have to uh, increase the taxes on the regular uh, cigarettes as well to, to prevent uh, the, the switching. Thank you. Um, I think this question is for uh, Michael Hayashi. Uh, Dr. Levy asked, how does the merger of Juul with Altria affect your analysis? Have you considered looking at the merger and how it might affect behavior in cigarette and e-cigarette industries? That's a good question. Um, I think in, in some ways, the, the particular analysis that I conducted is um, assumes the the kind of the merger of Juul and Altria, or or it assumes that Juul and Altria act essentially as one tobacco company entity. And the way that it informs the results is that because because we're treating Juul and Altria essentially as one entity, that gives Altria the differential market dominance that motivates their responses to to policy. If if Juul and Altria existed as completely separate things, then Altria wouldn't have the the e-cigarette platform, I think, to be able to to use as kind of a release valve from from the menthol ban. So I think I think there's there's two sides to it. One is that um, the Juul Altria merger enables differential market dominance, but also if we were looking at smaller e-cigarette companies or or tobacco companies that don't have a presence in, in a given product category, then I think we might think that they would be more sensitive to policies that hit their particular product category. Great. Thank you, Michael. Um, there's one more question. Um, and we'll do that. We'll make that the last one because we're really approaching the hour here. This is also for Dr. Hayashi. Uh, the assumption was that smokers would either switch to e-cigs or quit. Have you thought about that smokers may also switch to other flavored tobacco products in your analysis? That's the first question. Uh, maybe I'll just leave it at that because there are a couple other questions added to that and you may wanna answer that in, in the, the chat if you wish, Michael. Sure. Um, I can actually hit the last part of the question really quick. Why, okay. why I use sales revenue as outcome rather than profits? And that honestly is because sales revenue is easier data to gain access to. Um, it's, it's easy to see total revenue. Profits would, would uh, profits are also accessible, but that includes information about like um, costs to get the net. Um, so it was, and it, it was sort of cleaner and simpler. Um, with regard to the assumption about e-cigarette or of menthol smokers behavior and their switching behavior, we have thought a little bit about the potential to switch to other products like cigarettes. Um, I haven't seen, I, I personally haven't seen quite as much uh, experimental data on the degree to which menthol smokers might switch to other cigarette products. That I think, um, 
I think that has, I don't have a prediction for how that would affect our results, essentially because I don't know off, I, I don't think I have any prior on whether I think, say, Reynolds menthol smokers are likely to switch to a Reynolds cigarette product. Like, I don't, I don't know the degree to which brand loyalty would, would apply in a case where, say, Newport goes away and, and is Reynolds positioned to, to have an equivalent tobacco a regular cigarette product? I'm not actually sure. So I think there's certainly po the potential for, um, for sort of brand loyalty to also keep menthol smokers within the same company, which of course would then reduce that company's willingness, I think, to support, uh, or, or it might slightly increase a company's willingness to, to support a ban because they're still able to keep their customers. Um, or if, if, um, if another company believes themselves to have a, a cigarette brand that they think they could, they could grab menthol smokers and, and incentivize them to, to use that brand, that I think would act similarly to the differential dominance between e-cigarettes and menthol cigarettes. Great, excellent. Thank you very much, Mikhail and Michael. Uh, wonderful job on your presentations today. And I thank all the participants who joined our webinar. Uh, this concludes our webinar. I hope you guys have a good week and we look forward to seeing you again on our future webinars. We'll have another one in the early part of uh, next year. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Thanks.